turn it up. Uh, so my name is uh, William Lamb. I work for VMware. Um, I run a blog called Virtually Ghetto. And um, today I'll be talking a little bit about some tips and tricks, uh, some not supported tips and tricks for uh, evaluating vSphere 5.5. And I'll be talking about some new interesting features. And I'll have a VBound bag exclusive for you guys at the very end um, that you guys will not want to miss. So disclaimer, just like our VMware presentations, this is not supported. I think you guys already know that. But what I want to highlight, please don't call VMware support on anything that I present on today. They really appreciate it. All right, so for the agenda, we're going to take a look at sort of what's the best way to um, evaluate and test uh, the latest release of vSphere 5.5. We'll take a look at some of the new storage uh, features such as uh, vFlash re uh, recache and uh, virtual SAN. I'll take a look at um, how you can access a VM console from any device. Uh, we'll also be looking at creating a realistic lab uh, in your test environment before you uh, put vSphere 5.5 into your production environment. Um, then we'll look at something really special for you guys and then uh, Q&A at the very end. So as you guys know, we just uh, released uh, vSphere 5.5. Just show of hands, you know, what's, what, or yell it out, what's the best way to test this, uh, these softwares in your lab? Near and dear to my heart. Nested virtualization, right? So this is like a freebie for you guys. So tip number zero, running a nested ESXi. You know, this is really a great way to functionally test and learn about vSphere 5.5. You know, prior to joining VMware, I was a vSphere administrator. And um, as we have new releases from VMware, I would actually put this in our lab, run in a nested ESXi configurations, and we used to do a lot of automatic deployments. And so I would do a lot of scripting, uh, kickstart configurations, and this is really a great way to um, deploy the code, understand functionally how it works, develop the scripts, and once you're confident with it, you can put it into your production environment and ensure that it will work before you have to you know, spend hours and hours of uh, testing on a physical hard piece of hardware, right? So great way to test it. Uh, ESX 5.5 can be nested within uh, both ESX 5.0 and 5.1. So you do not need to be running the latest version of vSphere to be able to run um, 5.5. One thing I do want to point out here is that uh, we do have a new requirement for memory. Uh, it used to be two gigabytes. Um, it is uh, four gigabytes now, so when you're upgrading your labs, you won't be able to do an upgrade immediately, so make sure you change your memory for your uh, nested ESXi VMs. So. The other thing I also want to mention, um, Nested EXI has support for running the uh, VMXNet 3 driver. Um, this was actually introduced in uh, vSphere 5.1. And um, the implementation for this was really to support something called the native device drivers. This is a new architecture that we've introduced within 5.1, primarily for our partners so that we have native drivers within ESXi. So these are native VM kernel drivers. And I implementation that uh, engineering built was this uh, VMXNet 3 VM kernel driver to provide to our partners so that they have an idea of how to build this native driver. And this actually allows you to run um, nested ESXi using this particular driver. Now in 5.5 it's actually much improved uh, in terms of some performance. And um, if you want to do some functional testing to see what a NIC would look like with 10 gigabit, this actually shows up at 10 gigabit. So if you need any type of functional testing, this will show it up. Um, so this is a nice little trick to uh, just let you guys know you can add that in and it'll, it'll actually work. So you guys have probably heard about some of the new storage features. Uh, vSphere fl uh, Flash Recache, right? It's a new feature uh, within vSphere 5.5 and it requires the use of SSDs. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have spare SSDs lying around. You know, so when we talk about using nested ESXi, how do we start doing some uh, testing with uh, SSDs within a ne uh, nested environment? So we had the ability to actually create uh, claim rules using ESXCLI um, in the vSphere 5.x release. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I just don't remember the syntax. It's very complex, convoluted, and it's really specific to ESXi. Uh, one of the things that was available in 5.0 that I actually recently found out was we have the ability to emulate a virtual SSD. Um, it requires virtual hardware eight or greater, and you add, you add this advanced uh, setting on the screen, so there's a SCSI bus ID uh, virtual SSD, and you set it either one or zero. And this will turn your nested ESXi VM to actually plumb up and show you a uh, SSD device. And this will allow you to test the new features of uh, vSlash uh, recache. The other piece um, that's also very interesting too is in, the, in this particular feature set, um, there's automatic physical SSD detection. And what I mean by that is that if you have an actual SSD device and you provision a virtual machine and you place a VMDK on this SSD device, it will actually automatically plumb up the, uh, the property to say that, hey, this VMDK is an SSD. Now, I've been asked, like, well, I want to go back the reverse. I have an SSD. I want to actually turn it into, a, like, a local drive. So you can actually use the same exact parameter and set it to zero. And so the underlying disk will be an SSD, and you can change that bit to show zero. So this is a really cool way if you want to do, like, vSAN testing on all flash, 
And this is a nice little trick if you want to do that for home lab testing, right? And um, I linked to a blog article that has all the details if you're interested in it. Um, but this is a really neat feature, and this is actually what I use um, to learn about vFlash and also vSAN. So here's a quick screenshot in the vSore web client. If you look at the disk, you'll see that there's a VMware identifier. And on the right-hand side, we have the device type. And you can see that it's actually showing SSD as the property type. Another uh, neat little trick right here. Um, is the ability to change the, uh, the VMDK so that it's no longer shown this mpx.vmhba. It's kind of annoying. Um, also, if you're doing scripting uh, on actual device lines, right, we normally will expose this NNA identifier. So if you want to kind of see functionally what that looks like, you can actually um, enable this property called disk.enable.uuid on the VM advanced settings. And when you uh, go through your nested VMs and it's hard disk, it's actually going to be using the NNA identifiers and stuff. So it's a neat little trick. Um, I've had, I found use for it from a scripting perspective and be able to see what the APIs would generate versus this generic MPX, which is not what you would normally see on your uh, physical hardware and stuff. So nice little trick that I'd be aware of. All right, virtual SAN. Anybody here heard about virtual SAN? Excited about it? Want to test it and everything? Um, so, you know, when this came out um, before we released it, you know, I put this in my lab and I have SSDs, right? And again, emulating uh, virtual SSD allowed me to test this functionality. But one of the things I found was that, you know, creating this nested VM that supported ESXi, it's, pretty, it's kind of complex, you know? You gotta set the memory, the correct CPU, you gotta enable VHV, which is the virtual hardware uh, virtualization bits, add the parameters for SSD, it's a lot of work. And I was like, I'm gonna be doing this more and more often, like, isn't there a better way of doing it? So what I ended up uh, thinking about this was I created an OVF template that had all these pre-configurations with all the disk, and you can extend the disk size, right? So I just made it very tiny, it's thin provision, so it's less than 1K, and I thought this might be useful to share with the community, so you can just download this, deploy three of them, install ESXi, and you can set up vSAN immediately and start functionally testing it. So that's exactly what I did with this one. I created a uh, OVF that um, set um, ESX 5.x, set it to virtual hardware 9, so you can actually run this in your vSphere 5.0 or 5.1 environments, I enable the uh, VHV uh, uh, virtualization hardware assisted uh, bit, um, so you don't have to check it in the vSphere web client. It's configured with two vCPUs, four gigabytes of memory, and I have uh, one hard disk that's two gigabytes just to install ESXi. I have another disk that is um, emulating an SSD property, so that's four gigabytes. And then I have an additional HDD, which is eight gigabytes. And again, this is all thin provision, um, so you can go in there and extend it if you want it to be a little bit bigger or add more disks to replicate a physical host that you might be thinking or considering for a vSAN implementation. And uh, you just import this using the vSphere web client. Um, and, an, and this is a key feature. If you don't import it using the vSphere web client, what's going to happen is that the enable H, uh, VHV property is actually not going to get enabled because that's a functionality of the UI. Um, so if you enable the C-sharp client, you have to go in and check that box yourself. So recommendation is use it, uh, import using the vSphere web client. And um, you know, very easy, import and go. And again, I have a blog article that has all the details and you can actually find the download link there. So I think this is really useful for home labs to quickly just get set up and functionally learn about uh, vSAN before you actually put it into a production environment or testing lab environment. All right, so access to VM console. Um, I'm a big Mac user. How many, any Mac users here? All right, we have a few. I'm not a big fan of Windows, as you guys probably might have heard. And I like to be able to access my VMs from any device, you know, not just from my Mac, maybe from my iPhone, iPad, right? So today, um, for a VM console perspective, we're really limited to just Windows and Linux using VM, VMware's uh, VMRC protocol to um, display the console. Um, there's no Mac OS X support, and the really nice thing about vSphere 5.5, which I'm really excited about, is that we've introduced Mac OS X support. So this is not just a VM console uh, to be able to view the console, but we have full support, meaning we can actually upload an OVF, we can mount an ISO, Right, so as part of the client integration package, we have all the functionality. So I'm really excited about it. And I know there's a few other guys out here that are super excited as well. Um, and then for the Mac OS X console specifically, it uses a new HTML5 VM console. So I don't know if you guys are aware of that. So if you're on, if you're on a Windows or Linux system, by default, the platform will automatically initiate a VMRC connection. So you'll be using the legacy, or what I call the legacy uh, VM console. And if you're on a Mac OS X system, it will actually deploy out the new HTML5 console. So knowing a little bit of that information, you know, it got me thinking about some things. And here's the UI for what that looks like. And you'll know if you're using a VMRC interface or the HTML5 by looking at the URL and you'll see console uh, as part of the VM path. So I thought about this, uh, it's kind of unfair, right? The Mac guys get something really, really cool. HTML5 browser, no flex, none of that stuff at all. 
I kind of want to share that with everybody else. I looked at the URL and I kind of thought about like, you know, what can I do to help, this, help you guys out? So it turns out I can actually get this running on an iPad, an iPhone, and even an Android device. So because it's HTML5, any browser that's HTML5 compatible, you can actually read it in the console. So what I ended up doing was I reverse engineered the URL path and using some APIs and, um, and I basically wrote a script and this could actually be impl implemented using a VCO script or even a PowerCLI script. Um, and it's actually not that difficult to do and what this allows you to do is create a one-time pre-authenticated session to a VM console. And I think this is actually really, really important. If you're building like a custom portal for your end users and you don't want to give them access to your vSphere client, you don't want to train them up and you, they really just need console access and they have authorization to their VM, this is a great way to just send them a URL link, have at it, right? And if they close it, the session's gone. Um, so this is really great for any kind of custom portal that you want to generate the links for them, one-time support links um, from a GSS or support perspective, um, or if you just want to be able to access your VM consoles from any device. Neat little trick. So I'll kind of go through this URL. It's a little bit complex. You don't have to you know, dig too deep into it. I have a blog article that goes into details. But if we took a look at the URL, you know, the first part of it is sort of this orange looking color. That's the host name of um, the vCenter server. Uh, this is the port. The port's actually configurable. By default on the vCenter appliance, it'll be 7331. It can be configurable and it's actually automatically will choose a free port. So if you happen to be using this, um, if you're using vCenter 5.5 for a Windows system and you happen to be using that port, it, the platform will dynamically pick a port. So it is kind of random. Uh, but out of the box, you can be guaranteed that's going to be that port. Um, the light blue color indicates the MoRef ID. So this is sort of the internal ID of the virtual machine. Uh, the light purple color designates the VM name. Uh, the darker green color designates the virtual center FQDN. This could technically be different than the host name. Um, it's an advanced property that you can change and so that you need to specify that. And then this next long string, this light green, is actually a session ticket. So this is what allows you to create that one-time session ticket. So if you were to create an automated portal system, you kind of have a daemon that would run and, and a user would request a console to a VM, this daemon would then issue an API called a vCenter and say, give me a one-time session ticket so that I can authorize this VM console. So once you aggregate this uh, URL together, the session's already pre-authenticated. This was something that you could not do before. Um, so I, I found this to be really, really useful. And then the last parameter is just the SHA-1 uh, SSL thumbprint of your vCenter server. So adding all this together will generate the, the nice little URL that um, you saw before. And I think this is a really neat feature, both for home labs as well for actual use cases. And I talked to a lot of customers, and they think this will be really useful for any kind of custom portal creations for their uh, end users and all that. So, Neat little trick, and again, this is not officially supported. Um, it's only supported through the Mac OS console, but you can see that by reverse engineering it, it's just a generic HTML5 browser, but definitely something useful. If you guys think it's useful, do let your technical account managers, VMware, know that this is a useful feature to have, and maybe we can make this a lot simpler in the future. And let me know if you guys have any questions. So the next part I kind of want to talk about was around creating a realistic lab environment. Um, it's great that we can deploy you know, nested environments and be able to test one or two hosts. But um, when you're writing scripts for your own production environments, usually you're going to have complex configurations, a lot of VMs, and it's just really hard to do that, especially with limited hardware and the budget, right? I don't have an infinite hardware. I don't have a big data center at home. I just have Mac Mini. And it only takes eight gigs of memory, right? So wouldn't it be nice to be able to build up an environment that's realistic to your production environments um, or something that you really want to test out from an inventory perspective, right? So if you're creating like a for a web client plugin and you want to test out, you know, what is that going to look like with all these different inventory objects? It'd be nice to be able to create that and test it. So something that I wrote about and shared in the vSphere 5.1 release is something called VC Sim, uh, vCenter Simulator. And this was available in vSphere 5.1 as part of VCSA, so this is only uh, within the vCenter appliance. So this is another great reason on why, you know, you should take a look at vCenter appliance and give it a shot. And it really simulates a real vCenter server. Now, other people in the community have kind of done this in the past where we persisted configuration data into the database. So you're kind of injecting fake data in, and you kind of have to make some of that stuff up. What vCSIM is, um, is something that's developed by VMware Engineering for some of the QA testing internal. And when you enable this um, functionality in the simulator, when you create a new VM object, you're not inserting something in the database. You're going through the actual vCenter code. So you will get an actual task object. You'll get a unique MoRef identifier that's being generated by the platform. It acts and simulates just like a real virtual machine. You can perform actions on it, so you can power it off, you can power it on, you get the right task, you'll see the right UI. So this literally is going through the actual vCenter code. We're not faking this stuff where other people were like, I'll just inject some data in the database, and then it artificially shows up, but when I try to delete it, 
platform crashes, right? So this is a really neat feature. And again, this was really developed internally for engineering. Um, but I thought that this would actually be really useful for a couple of use cases. The first one uh, is around learning about the vSphere APIs, right? You can set this up. You don't need any hosts. It will generate the right properties for you. And you can start using like the vSphere mob. You can use PowerCLI. You can use VCO. Learn about the APIs. You know, if there's new APIs that came out with 5.5, you don't want to spend time setting up your home lab. You can just set this up, turn this property on, and automatically you have a vSphere environment that you can start kind of poking at it. Of course, it's very limited in terms of its capabilities, so you're not going to be able to do everything, but it's very useful for some of these use cases that I've listed out. The second one is around developing and creating various inventory scripts, right? You know, first thing that a lot of people um, start with, like PowerCLI, is just reporting. I want to create a report on all the VMs that have a snapshot. Why should you have to create real VMs, create snapshots? You can actually use this and start um, simulating the, the environment, and then this allows you to create some scripts and pull that information. So really useful for reporting. Um, the other one is around developing performance metrics. There's actually a lot of parameters in vCenter Simulator that I'm, I'm just going to gloss over, but I have an extensive blog article that goes through it. You can actually query a bunch of performance stats. You can actually artificially set latencies in some of these statistics. And so if you have some issues that you're trying to troubleshoot in your environment, you can actually create some of that. You know, it's not going to be 100%, but you can create some of that in your environment, go through your scripts and kind of run through that and kind of see what's that going to look like before you actually apply it to your production environment. So there's a lot of very nice performance customization as part of vCenter Simulator that's really useful as well. And then the last one, like I mentioned earlier, is around developing a, a vSphere Web Client plugin. This might be more useful for like some of our partners. Um, you know, you want to create 10,000 VMs. I don't know if you guys notice here, but you know, in this inventory, I have 10,000 VM objects and 480 hosts. So you can hit the configuration maximums if you, if you want to, right? And so it's really great to be able to see that and then create the plugins and kind of see what that looks like. And in the 5.1 release of vCenter Simulator, sort of the first release of it, um, it was kind of hokey. And, and what I mean by that is that you got to edit the VPXD configuration. It's this XML. It's really ugly. It's not very easy to use. And easily, there can be some typos, right? So this is tip number four, but really, What's really cool that I wanted to share with you guys here is that for 5.5, we actually have a new release of VC Sim. Uh, I'm just dubbing it 2.0. None of this stuff is even official. I'm just giving it build numbers. But um, there's a lot of new features that, that's inherited in here, and these are just really high-level points. I have a blog article that goes into way more detail. So some of the new support that we've added here is being able to manage the VDS. So you now have full CRUD operations. You can create, you can delete it, you can update it, you can change the DB port groups on a virtual machine. Uh, we also have uh, VCNS support, so now you can actually create an edge gateway device. So you don't even need an actual edge gateway device. It'll create it and simulate some of those operations. You can create org VDC networks. So this is really useful for any, uh, if you guys do anything with vCloud Director. And if you want to learn about the APIs, this is a great way to learn it. Uh, we now have the ability to persist the inventory. So if you come up with this particular configuration, you say, you know, this is my dev environment. I want it to always look like this. In the past, once you restart that appliance, it's gone. You got to recreate it. Um, we now have, allow you to, um, save it, and you can actually store these in different configuration files. You can share it, right? So if you come up with this really interesting environment, and you're like, I'm hitting this particular bug, you can give this to VMware. You can give it to somebody else and say, here it is. Load it in. Go through your, your, uh, go through your testing and all that. So I think that's a really uh, cool use case for it. And then the other one is really you can start doing custom configurations. So uh, what the developers uh, did in this release was to start to um, isolate each of the builds of ESX. So before, it was just one version of ESXi. I think it was like 4.0. Now it's actually broken up to directories. So you can have a directory for 5.5, for 5.1. So you can actually simulate different versions and mix them up. So it's really, really customizable. And, and I've asked the developer to kind of look into you know, more ways. And if you guys have ideas of things that you would like to see as you guys play with this fling, uh, do let us know. And then the last feature that I want to talk about was that um, before it was really hard to set up, right? Now we've introduced some very simple CLI commands called vmware-vc sim start and stop. And I'll go through a quick demo of what that looks like and how easy it is to really get started. So let me uh, power on my appliance. Any questions so far? Any comments? Good so far? You guys interesting? Yeah? All right. You guys able to see that fine? OK. So within, so as I mentioned earlier, there is uh, the new VC sim start and stop command. So if I just, oh, I guess that's not going to be too useful. Uh, oops. Uh, I think it might be. Yeah, it's not really useful when it's a lot of text. 
kind of see that. So when you run the dash help, there's sort of three options that you can um, start the simulator. The first one is sort of an empty configuration. So if you want nothing and you want to use scripts to build up your inventory, um, or you want to take a look at what's there, which is really just nothing. It just gets you a basic vCenter server up and running with no inventory. Then you run the v, VMware-VC sim start and you uh, specify the word empty. And that will just give you nothing. And you can kind of use PowerCLI, VCO, whatever scripts you want to build up that inventory. So that's one way of doing it. Second one is something called defaults. And they're, they're under the path, uh, under Etsy VMware VPX, there is a VC sim-default configuration file. Um, and it's fully documented. And this has a very generic configuration. You know, some amount of host, some amount of resource pool, some amount of VMs that's powered on. And if you just specify the default flag, it automatically generates the inventory for you without you having to think about it. And then the last, um, and then the last one, you can specify a configuration file. And you can also specify um, it on the command line. So if you need to do something really quickly, you can say, start VC sim, I want two clusters, and I want five VMs. You don't even need to create a file, and you hit go. So we'll go ahead and show what the default looks like. So we'll go ahead and enter the command. Uh, and the way you set this up is actually really easy. You set up the VCSA just like you would if you were to deploy it in production. You set it up, go through the normal wizard, um, but instead of adding anything to the host, you then come into the SSH session, and then this is where you start dealing with the commands. Um, so here I've already pre-set up uh, my VCSA, and I'm gonna go through and run the configurations, and then we'll take a look at um, the environments once it's loaded back up. So. And there's a lot of uh, different example configuration files. So there's different inventory lookups. And um, there's a lot of documentation. And I've also blogged about this as well. So all the links will be available um, on, on the presentation as well afterwards. So here we're finishing up um, reinitializing. So we basically stopped the vCenter server, loaded the configuration. And what this uh, script is really, it's just a wrapper taking those configurations. And it's actually injecting into the VPXD file. So it's backing it up injecting the new configuration files, and then restarting again. And then when you disable it, it'll undo all the configuration changes. So it's very um, customizable and modular, and you can easily transport it. So here we're just waiting for a VPXD to come back online. And then uh, we should be able to log into this environment and see some VMs. So any of you guys think this might be useful in your environment? Interesting, yeah. Okay. So now I have an inventory. I have my vCenter server. You know, so the default profile has the data center. And these are all um, pre-configured with the name, so that, uh, you can change them afterwards. Uh, one, of the, one of the feature requests I've asked of the engineer is to be able to allow me to not only specify what the inventory is going to look like, but also specify the name. So you can actually set your particular host names. Um, so this might be good for demos. Right, you don't even need to, a real environment. I just don't tell your customers or your clients that, but it's a really great way of doing that. And here you can see I have 64 virtual machines. Some of them are powered off. So let's you know, come in here and power one of these guys off. See, we have a task kicked off, right? So it acts and feels just like a vCenter server. And um, again, it's not implementing every single functionality, but you know, reporting definitely and all the inventory structures will be available to you. Um, so again, it's a really great tool uh, for, for scripting learning about the APIs, and I highly recommend um, you know, new users or even advanced users to take a look at it and see how that might fit in your home lab. And it's a great way to get familiar with uh, vSphere platform and then also get used to the uh, vCenter appliance, which I really, really love. OK. So that's that. And then uh, there's some links. Um, you can also do a vCloud Director Simulator, too. So there's some uh, advanced properties that you can set within the vCloud Director database. And it basically hooks on to vCenter Simulator. And then you can basically simulate all the vCloud uh, director constructs like org VDC, provider VDCs, add host, remove host, put them in maintenance mode. So you can see the possibilities are really endless, right? And it's really to your imagination of what you think this might be giving to you in your own environment and the use cases that you might be solving with it. Okay. Okay, so that's the end of my presentations. Any questions? Seems like you guys are waiting for something. Hold on. Yes, they work. They work on all things. Yeah, I thought you guys would have caught it. 
did you guys did you guys see it? So I, so I told you guys that I would have a very exclusive V brown bag for VMworld. I showed it to you guys. You didn't see it? No? All right, time for a demo. Let's exit out of here. So what I'm doing here is um, just resuming a regular nested ESXi. It's a 5.5 VM running on Fusion. Nothing special. No configuration, nothing, right? So this is standard, no trickery, right? So SSHs this real quick. You guys see something interesting there? Oops. Are you guys interested in that? Yeah? Yeah? You guys gotta be more excited than that. All right? I thought you guys I thought you guys might like that. All right. So so this is something that we've been asking for, and I know that we've heard a lot from you guys, and I've been pushing very, very hard within internally. And you know, and you don't even, if you guys really think this is really useful, we'll be putting this as a fling. Um, but I do want to, you know, throw a quick shout out to one of our engineers, Jim Matson. He's one of the guys that's actually been working on Nested Virtualization for multiple times. And you might have seen his name. I blogged about it. Um, and it's something I reached out to him and say, hey, you know what? This is really useful. I find there's a lot of use cases for VMware internally uh, for having this functionality, right? And so I say, hey, we've heard from the customers, from you guys. And so I said, let's put something together. And so what we have here is VMware tools for nested ESXi, installable as a VIB. And um, I'll show you how that works. And it's actually very simple. So to install this, uh, we'll be using uh, ESXCLI, specifying the dash V flag. And then you'll need to give the full path of the VIB tool. And then you need to specify the dash F option to install. Actually, I may need to put it into maintenance mode, maybe. Yeah. Oh, okay. So after it's done, that's it. You know, one liner to install it, and then all we do is do a reboot, and VMware Tools will be running on Nested ESXi. We have a VMware Tools daemon that's been purpose built for Nested ESXi, um, and I think there's a lot of interesting use cases for it, specifically for within VMware. Um, we build a lot of what we call VPods, so nested environments all completely isolated. You know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to right click and just say shut down versus having to shut power off or you need to SSH in? It's really painful. And then if you use like something like vCloud Director, you can set all the priority shutdown and you can just say shut down the vApp and everything will shut down cleanly. So that is the secret surprise. So what we've introduced here um, is a new VIB. Um, it will support ESXi 5.0, 5.1, and 5.5. So you don't need to be using the latest release. It will support all this release. Uh, we'll be distributing this as a VIB that you can download off of VMware's uh, Fling website, and that's something that we're working on right now. Um, and like I said, to install it, it's just ESXCLI software VIB install, dash V, dash F, and then the full path to the VIB um, file. And what do you get by installing this, right? So the first one, of course, is just basic power operations. I can go to the web client, I can go to C Sharp client, I can just right click, shut down, really nice. The other piece of it is I also have the ability to um, expose the vSphere guest operations API. So now I can actually do some very interesting automation in my nested ESXi environment. If I want to pull files out from a troubleshooting perspective, from logs, if I want to execute a command that has no APIs, I now have an interface, right? So guest operation API was formerly known as the VIX API. And what it does, it allows you to perform operations within the guest OS as if you were basically logged into it. So there's an interface that's provided through VMware tools. So that's why having tools in nested ESXi is actually really interesting and important. And by using this uh, implementation, I can go in and I can run any arbitrary command within the ESXi shell as you would um, if you didn't have APIs or CLIs automated. Now, again, this is only for nested ESXi only, but it opens up a variety of use cases. And I'm sure you guys will find some interesting uh, things with it. A couple of things that you can't do with it or some assumptions that have been asked already internally is that if you um, install this VIB, say, on 5.1, one of the things that you can do from a UI perspective is I can right click on and say, upgrade VMware tools. You will not be able to do this. Um, again, and this is a custom VIB that we built. It's not something that's being distributed uh, with our actual ISO release. So you're not gonna be able to right click and you're probably just get an error. So I just wanna let you guys know you won't be able to do that. 
And again, it's not bundled in. Um, so if you wanted to sort of have this as part of your image, you can use uh, Image Builder uh, for PowerCLI to in, um, integrate this into your ESXi ISO. So if you want to do nested deployments, you can integrate it in so you don't have to install this div each time. Or you can also automate using a Kickstart script. So that's another um, way of implementing it. So it's really uh, useful. And um, we are gonna, we're working on it right now to get this as a, uh, as a fling. So we heard you push for you guys, and this is what it brings. So hopefully it was enough for, to hold off on beer for a little bit longer. Um, so yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions, comments, um, you know, if you guys really like this fling, enjoy it, it's a lot of hard work from our engineers, you know, do leave a comment, you know, you guys enjoyed or some of the use cases, you know, our, our engineers really do appreciate that. Um, so yeah, so once that's out, I'll let you guys know. So thank you for attending. I don't know if you guys have any questions or no questions.